Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about the work that's going on uh, with the cosmic microwave background, with its radiation from the early hot universe, and the telescopes that we used to observe it at the South Pole and in Chile on the Atacama Plateau. And this is a picture of the South Pole telescope um, during the winter of 2009, which will be the main focus of this talk. I'll begin by giving an introduction to cosmology, use this to introduce the cosmic microwave background and why you'd like to study it. From there, I'll talk about why we go to the South Pole to study the cosmic microwave background and what it's like to go down there, um, and how we built the telescope and the survey that we are conducting with that telescope. And then I'll conclude with a few words on what we are learning about cosmology, and in particular, the early uh, expansion of the universe during the inflationary epoch that started off cosmology. So cosmology is the study of the universe around us, which has been an age-long pursuit of mankind. This is a picture of the night sky. Um, so you can have the galaxy and all the stars and galaxies of the sky. And what we're interested in studying cosmology is both how the universe began um, and how we came to be, how all this structure came to form in the universe around us. And in pursuit of that, we built larger and better telescopes. So to give you an idea of the progress, back in the 1920s when Edwin Hubble was first discovering that the universe was expanding. Uh, this is an example of the data he was using to do that with an image of a nearby galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. Um, and this is the equivalent image that we can take today from the Hubble Space Telescope. So there's been a tremendous improvement in the quality of the instruments and data that we are getting about the universe around us. And this is important because as you build better telescopes, you can see further away objects, which means you're looking further back in time. Because telescopes, in effect, are a form of time machine. The speed of light is finite, so as you go to some object that is hundreds or thousands or billions of light years away, you're also looking that far back in time. And to give you an idea of how uh, some typical distances in astronomy, the sun is a few minutes away, um, nearby stars can be light years away, a galaxy like the Milky Way or the Andromeda Galaxy is you know, 100,000 light years across. And then if you go all the way back to the beginning of time, you're looking at something across like 14 billion years into the past. So 14 billion light years past. Now our deepest image uh, today of the universe from the Hubble Space Telescope is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, shown here. It's something like 3.8 by 3.8 arc minutes across. I'll just give you an idea of the scope. It's something like 1% of the size of the full moon. So it's a very small patch of sky that you're seeing here. Yet within the small patch of sky, you can see something like 10,000 galaxies across this area. Uh, this is about two weeks of Hubble time. So it takes something like uh, half a million years for the Hubble Space Telescope to cover the entire sky to this kind of depth. Now, although there are a lot of galaxies here that you can see, um, one observation here is, of course, that most of this image is not colored, but rather black. So you don't actually see any object along most of the lines of sight in this image. And that is saying that we are actually seeing a time before galaxies are forming. This traces back to one of the uh, old paradoxes called Olbers paradox, which in a uh, static infinite universe, any direction you see, eventually you should hit a galaxy, right? So along any point of sky, you would see a white point uh, so you'd expect the night sky to be white rather than black. Um, and the way around that is either that you're in a non-static universe, and we're seeing a time before the galaxies were actually forming um, when you go along most of these lines of sight, back 14 billion years or so. Um, this is a product of what wavelengths you're looking at. This, this is an optical image. If you're looking at lower frequencies uh, or longer wavelengths, closer to what, say, your microwave uses, and the microwave wavelength, this guy actually is glowing. Uh, with a constant background of light along any direction that you might look at. This was first, uh, and this actually accounts for most of the energy density in light in the universe. It's more than 10 times the density of optical photons that exist in the microwave background. So this is the dominant source of light in the entire universe. It was discovered back in 1965 with a 20-foot telescope, I think in uh, New Jersey, uh, the Bell Labs with Penzias and Wilson. And they were trying to dig into the noise model for their telescope, and they found an unexplained source of noise of a few Kelvin of unexplained noise that they eventually traced back to be this background. And it's pretty impressive when you think about it, to have enough faith in your noise model to uh, 
rather than say it's an excess noise in your electronics to trace it back to an actual astrophysical source. This was a confirmation. Uh, it turned out that people had predicted this would exist. If you had a hot early universe, there should be some relic radiation that has been redshifted down to a few Kelvin in the data today. And it turns out to be about 2.7 Kelvin background of light in the universe. And this won the Nobel Prize um, in the year I was born in 1978. Um, so if you just scattered, um, like, like on a television screen, you might see static. Um, so if you had a radio and you hear static, that'd be the noise. This is the radio telescope. Um, so with the cosmic microwave background, what are we actually doing? Well, we're looking back to the very beginning of the universe. And we're finding that when you look back to the very beginning of the universe, you're seeing uh, effectively a very hot early universe. So the primordial fireball. Um, and it's some form of a hot plasma. So you have electrons and protons and photons in an initial soup. Um, and the idea is that these electrons and protons are initially in a thermal equilibrium, so the same temperature. Um, however, event, as the universe cools down, at some point your electrons and protons are going to recombine to form hydrogen. Um, and the cross section, the scattering cross section between hydrogen and uh, light is much lower than with electrons, so the light can then escape and see us today. This is like the surface of the sun, uh, where you have the hot plasma. Um, so when you look at the surface of the sun, you're effectively looking at the same hot plasma that you're talking about with this kind of situation. Um, and we're looking back to the early hot plasma. So we're inside this glowing sphere, since in any direction we see, eventually if you look back far enough, you'll see the same hot plasma. Now, if you think about a fireball, you would probably expect to have different temperatures if you look at different directions. Like if you see a fireball in a movie, there'll be uh, variations in the temperature. You can see structure in that fireball. Um, one of the surprises when people started looking at the cosmic microwave background is that it was, in fact, really, really smooth. So this is an image of what the cosmic microwave background actually looks like. Um, so we discovered this uh, light back in 1965, and it took more than two decades to actually discover any kind of structure in it. Uh, for more than two decades, every time people tried to look for uh, differences between the temperature on different points of the sky, they failed to actually detect any difference. They just saw uh, the same temperature everywhere. And this took until the COBE satellite uh, released the results in 1992 to discover any form of variation across the sky in this temperature. So it was smooth to one part in 100,000, which is a pretty impressive degree of isotropy across the entire sky. And this won the second Nobel Prize in the cosmic micro background. Now the problem here is why would the temperatures be the same across the entire universe, right? Um, if you normally, if the temperature is the same, you have two objects that are in close uh, contact with each other, right? If you have even between the side of this room, the temperature is varying between the front of the room and the back of the room by more than one part in 100,000, right? It's probably varying by a few degrees, and you know, probably a few hundred Kelvin in this room. So how do you get points in the sky that are billions of light years apart actually have the same temperature? This is a problem for cosmology. And the way we can address this in cosmology is to go to inflation. The idea of inflation is basically, rather than um, one way to solve this problem is to say that at some earlier points of time, uh, the entire universe was actually much closer together. So these points could be in, a, there could be a thermal link between different points on the sky. So if you start off with the universe very small, and then suddenly, virtually instantaneously, blow it up by a million, 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 million factors, a very, very large factor to the observable universe, then it won't have enough time to change temperature during that process. And you can explain why different points on different points of the sky have the same temperature. So this is a very rapid superluminal expansion of the universe uh, that can lead to the same temperature on different parts of the sky. Another prediction of inflation would be that you have a flat universe, which is good because we actually observe a flat universe around us. Um, and so this means it's not, uh, <clears throat> say, there's no curvature of the universe. If you go away from the planet, um, there's no uh, attraction between different points. And the way to understand this is if you measure a curvature of, say, a balloon, right? A balloon may have a curvature of, you know, a few inches for what the circle radius of that balloon is. Um, if you took that balloon and then blew it up by, you know, a very large uh, one times a lot of zeros, suddenly its radius curve would be much larger than the Earth, and it would look flat to any scale that you're measuring. 
Um, so this rapid expansion also leads to a flat universe. Now, studying the cosmic background is a great thing to study because it's our first snapshot of the universe. Um, this is the first point you can see with uh, electromagnetism. So it's uh, our strongest view of what can happen in the early universe. So if you want to study insulation, you'd like to study the cosmic microwave background and other physics of the early universe. Now, to go to the cosmic microwave background, you soon can either do observations from the ground or from satellites. Um, and the ground is significantly cheaper uh, to build telescopes on the ground than if you want a satellite, so that's obviously a nice option. And that explains why we're going to the South Pole. The South Pole is really the best site on the planet to do measurements at these frequencies. Um, this is an image of the South Pole. Um, and the reason why you'd go to the South Pole for this uh, relates to what an atmosphere is opaque to these microwave photons, these microwave light. There are effectively two molecules in the atmosphere that you care about, oxygen and water, H2O. Oxygen, as you all know, is well mixed in the atmosphere. You never have to worry about going into a room and running out of oxygen and fainting. Water vapor, on the other hand, is not very well mixed in the atmosphere. You, know, you can have a rain cloud blow past, be wet, and then it'll come back, it'll be dry. Uh, over the course of the year, it'll be dry or wet in patches. Um, and what that means is that water vapor leads to a signal that varies with time, uh, depending on how wet the water is, how much water is actually above your telescope at a given instant. Now, the way to reduce oxygen is to go to a relatively high site. A higher elevation, there's less oxygen. Uh, the atmosphere is thinner. And the South Pole actually is about 10,000 feet high. Uh, this is actually two miles of ice that you're sitting on. Uh, that's how thick the ice pack is at the South Pole. And by virtue of being really cold, there's not a whole lot of water vapor. As you know, during the winter, uh, your skin dries out. Um, the South Pole gets down the coldest temperature every winter is right around the sublimation point of dry ice at sea level. So that's really cool. Um, in fact, I suspect the reason it's plateau is probably due to the uh, energy bath of all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And when you get down that cold, there's not a whole lot of water in the atmosphere. So you get very little uh, signal from water vapor, which means you have a very clean uh, observing window. Other advantages to the South Pole include the fact that you only have one day-night cycle over the entire year. The sun is below the horizon for six months of the year. So you don't have to worry about your telescope heating up or cooling off over the course of the day. Um, and you can observe the same patch of sky all the time. Um, uh, you don't have to worry about Earth rotation, uh, moving your patch of sky above or below the horizon. And although the South Pole is quite remote, uh, which would definitely make it a hard site to operate, uh, for diplomatic reasons uh, related to the Antarctic Treaty, the US supports uh, extremely good logistical support they supply power, they supply food, they supply lodging, they fly you down there, they fly you back. So you, all the stuff that would normally make this rather intractable is dealt with for you, um, which is great. Now, our telescope began uh, back in 1984. This was a collaboration. Yes? No, it's literally the South Pole, the telescope about a kilometer away from the South Pole. Uh, the main station is a few feet away from the South Pole. Um, it, yeah. So we had, yeah, so the first experiment down there was EMILY, uh, which is a collaboration of the United States and France in 1984. And this was effectively a characterization experiment. They want to see how good the conditions were at the South Pole and compare that to other sites on the planet. And what they found was that the noise was a factor of 10 times lower at the South Pole than Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is still a site that people use for these observations. Uh, this is the same place as the Keck Telescope, the Caltech 2 Millimeter Observatory, and other sites in Hawaii. Um, and as you might expect, that's a tropical island. Although it's 14,000 feet high, it's still a tropical island. So there's a lot of humidity in Mauna Kea compared to the South Pole. Um, and so you have a factor of 10 improvement. And this motivated a lot of experiments to go down there to exploit these good observing conditions for uh, their experiment. Um, initially, this was a hard slogging because people tried to do this only during the summer, which is when people could actually be down there. You could fly down there, try to set up your experiment, take a little bit of data, then dismantle it and fly back. So you didn't have a whole lot of time to do this because the station's only open from November to February. 
and you know your travel time is a little bit indifferent on both the beginning and the end of that period. So you only have a couple of months to do this in. This changed um, when an undergraduate or someone who just graduated from their bachelor's degree, John Kovac, um, volunteered to winter um, in 1994. So the way I heard it was the experiment didn't quite work at the end of the summer, and he said he'd stay for the winter and get it working and uh, take data over the winter. This is a picture of him carrying a liquid nitrogen dewer up to the telescope uh, during that winter. And this actually was a game changer for the experiment at South Pole. Because when you can start taking data during the winter, first of all, you have a lot more time. Instead of a few weeks, now you have 10 months to take data, um, which is a lot more data for the same experiment. Right? You get a lot more result out of that. And also, you have more time to set up your data. And since experiments can then last multiple years, uh, you can just you know, leave it there for multiple years running, which is a big deal for your data collection. And this uh, led to a host of really important uh, experiments being located at the South Pole. Um, this is just listing some of the ones in the dark sector right now, which is where all these telescopes are located. This is the daisy mount over here. Um, the daily mount on the right-hand side, uh, which is, and then they had QUAD, which is a meta-acronym for QUAD on DAISY, uh, and KEKERE. You had ACBAR, my thesis experiment, over here. The bicep mount, and then the South Pole Telescope on the left-hand side. Um, before I move on to the South Pole Telescope, I'll just say a few words about ACBAR. Go ahead. Yes, they call it the Dark Sector Lab. Um, Mostly because they put astronomical instruments out there. So they have restrictions on, say, using radios and other objects. Um, so ACBAR was a relatively early telescope. Um, it was, and to give you an idea of the improvements that we had in South Pole, I'll talk about the engineering that we used in ACBAR. So this is a two meter telescope from side to side. Our electronics are in these heated crates over here. Uh, the motors on the young them are in basically little blankets and heaters outside. And similarly, our doer is in this blanker, blankets and heater system uh, open to the elements. So the entire telescope was outside uh, open to the exterior temperatures, so it had to deal with the cold weather instruments. Um, it also had liquid cryogens, um, liquid helium, liquid nitrogen, like you saw John Kovac carrying up his back to carry up the telescope. You know, our winter over had to go outside a couple every couple of days to fill the cryogen. Uh, when we fast forward to the South Pole Telescope, there's a number of advantages, improvements that we made in the engineering to deal with the um, weather patterns at the Antarctica. So, Akbar, the motors were outside in these blankets. Um, the South Pole Telescopes are inside the building, so they can uh, operate at the same temperature. You don't have to worry about the temperature variations and uh, weather proofing your motors. Similarly, our cryostat, where our instrument is, is inside this uh, container, which can actually dock to the main building, and there are doors here that let you access it without going outside. So you don't have to go outside to work with an instrument, and there's no open cycle cryogen. There's only a closed cycle cooling system, so there's no more going outside to fill your cryostat with liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. It's all closed cycle, um, and we don't lose any data. Uh, to running out of these uh, liquid cryogens during the winter, where obviously you cannot get a refill. In addition to those advantages, um, of course, this is a larger telescope, 10 meters, which gives you a better resolution on the sky. Effectively, you can see smaller objects. And it's been designed for large surveys, um, survey large areas of the sky, so it has fast scan speeds and large field of view. The detectors are a uh, key part of this has been the, the detectors of our instrument. And these were largely built at the Berkeley Nanofab facility. Um, the first uh, focal plane was built by a graduate student, Eric Shurkoff, at the Nanofab facility. And right now, uh, another uh, student, uh, Toki, is building prototyping for the detectors for the next focal plane, again at that facility, in the Nanofab facility. The collaboration is on the order of 50 people shown here at a meeting in Chicago. Um, this is actually part of the this metal ring here. It's the bearing of our telescope that we had to replace in 2009. Um, and you know, a number of these people are at UC Berkeley, as well as other places. Now, to get down to the South Pole, you effectively are going to take a commercial flight to New Zealand, 
um, something like LAX to Auckland to Christchurch, if you're lucky. In New Zealand, you spend a couple of days there. Uh, you pick up your cold weather gear, uh, what these people are wearing, and you get a briefing, and then hop on a National Guard jet to go to the South Pole. And these are, I guess, the New York National Guard that you take. Uh, this is a LC-130, which is a propeller-driven plane. Some people who are more fortunate are going to take uh, jet planes, which gives you about half the travel time to Antarctica, about twice as fast. Uh, this takes about eight hours to go from Christchurch to McMurdo Station. It's what the inside of the jet looks like. Um, it's actually relatively comfortable as long as your jet's not too crowded. Um, you're on cargo nets, but those cold weather gears, you know, inches of down that you can lie down on and use as a pillow or blanket. You can, if there's space in the cargo, you can lie down. Um, and you fly down across ocean, and then across ice with the Ross ice shelf um, to, till you land in McMurdo Station, uh, one of the runways down there. After you get out of the plane, you get on a bus and take a bus into the station. Uh, this is the point at which I saw my first penguin during the uh, taking a picture out of the bus. It was just watching us drive past. Uh, the number of penguins you see varies wildly based on what time of year you are there. If you're in McMurdo long enough, you can also take a tour of the rookery, but they only do that one day a week in order to reduce uh, the disruption of the rookery area. One thing you can do in McMurdo is uh, climb up a local hill, Ob Hill, for Observation Hill, which gives you a view both of McMurdo um, on this side, basically looks like an industrial yard to be honest. On the other side there's a New Zealand station, the Kiwi station, which is in green. Um, and then in another direction southwards you can see uh, Mount Erebus. And this is, you know, Mount Erebus, which is the, uh, I think, the highest, uh, the southernmost volcano in the world. And it's the second highest volcano in Antarctica. It was first climbed in 1908 by members of the Shackleton Expedition. Uh, today, if you don't listen to the rules, you can take a snowmobile up there, although they do not want you to do that. Uh, <laughs> there's been a monitoring station on the side of Erebus. Um, for about the last 40 years to monitor the volcano. Um, so generally, ideally, you'll spend a day or so in McMurdo before going to the South Pole again. Uh, so you get back on the Hercules this time. Uh, you'll notice this Hercules has these sleds, effectively these are skis, to allow the plane to land on snow because at the South Pole they only have a snow runway. Um, and yeah, you hop back on and you go into the depths of the continent. There are some features you see uh, as you go into the continent. You'll see mountain ranges, you'll see glaciers, uh, rivers of ice flowing beneath you. Um, but as you approach the pole, there's not a whole lot happening. It's pretty much a big, white, uh, empty field as far as you can see. And this is the pole from the air. Uh, the main feature you see here is the runway, uh, which they pack down. Over here is what I called the dark sector earlier. This is where the telescopes are. Um, and then this is the main station. This is effectively a storage area where they keep stuff out on the ice that can be frozen for storage. You get out of your plane, uh, you go to the station to get your bunks, um, and then you get to work. Uh, there's, as you can see, it's effectively very similar to a desert, uh, except with snow instead of sand or ice. There's not a whole lot, well, there's no vegetation, there's no native animal life. Um, you, I think I saw one animal per trip, more or less. There are occasionally skua, which are birds from the coast that get lost and end up wandering into the pole. Um, they generally do not survive to get back out because there's no food for a long, long way. Um, but there's some interesting meteorological uh, images that you do get. In addition to the patterns on snow, you'll get what's called sun dogs, where you'll have effectively these patterns around the sun. And these are caused by ice crystals in the atmosphere. These ice crystals have a preferred orientation uh, due to gravity, so they tend to uh, orient themselves along the long axis up. And then that gives you reflections along given angles from the sun. That gives you these patterns on the relative to the sun. In fact, they can go out to much longer distances and be more complex, but they're pretty hard to photograph since they're sort of a log. Uh, they get faint as you go away, and your cameras have these linear responses. So you're down here typically between November and February. Um, so you're there, of course, over Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving. Um, 
They make some attempt for Christmas decorations. This is a Christmas tree put up by the uh, machine shop. Um, you can't have a live tree, but you can have a metal tree. Uh, and there are other festivities such as, you know, we did snow sculptures where they dig up a block of ice and then let people carve it up into whatever shape they would like and then have, you know, a competition. They also have what they call the race around the world where they, you know, set up a course around the South Pole and you do two laps around the world. Um, <laughs> roughly a two mile course um, <laughs> for that race. Now, it's, when you think about building a telescope at the South Pole, you're doing it a little bit differently than you would at other sites. Normally, you might you know, go down to bedrock, lay concrete foundation, and build on you know, the solid foundation. Of course, at the pole, you're on two miles of ice, so you can't go down to bedrock. Um, so what you actually do is you effectively are just going to try to pack down the snow to make a fairly dense layer of ice, and then build on that dense ice. And this is the um, building. I believe they're actually taking ice cores right here in order to test how dense the snow is at the moment and whether they need to pack down more for that snow foundation. Uh, they were rebuilt from that point. Then the base structure uh, in 2005, this is where we were. As you see, the South Pole Telescope, which is, you know, uh, what is it, it's 30 feet across the, for the primary. It's worth noting that this is all carried by a plane. And a plane is actually not that large. Um, you can see the relative height of this cargo bay is only, you know, roughly a couple of people in order to get in. So all of our pieces had to be broken down to fit within this plane. Um, and our longest piece is exactly the diagonal that you can fit within that cargo bay. In addition, of course, planes don't have that much carrying capacity. Um, you know, 22,000 pounds while we have a 600,000 pound telescope. So it takes a lot of plane flights to get our telescope down there. Um, as you would imagine from this, our primary mirror is not a single piece of metal. It's a segmented uh, mirror where we have a bunch of different chunks uh, that we had to assemble to form the complete primary. And that's that being done under a protective awning uh, in 2006. And by January of 2007, we were putting the primary mirror onto the telescope mount. And shortly thereafter, we were ready to begin observations. And this is a picture taken shortly before observations began in 2007. And I'll now transition to the third part of the talk, uh, the South Pole Telescope Survey. Not a whole lot. The precipitation, actual snow falls on the order of an inch a year. Um, however, you get much more that's just blown in. About 12 inches a year is blown. Uh, by the, there's a pretty steady wind at about 10 uh, miles per hour. Um, you're talking uh, November to February. And that's the period in which the, they allow flights in. When it gets too cold, then you don't want to land your plane because if anything, uh, you know, plane engines have a temperature, uh, allowed temperature range. If stuff gets too cold, the gaskets fail, rubber freezes, you know, everything goes bad. Um, so. They really do not like landing planes uh, if it's too cold. I mean, you may have heard when they've had some medical emergencies like the stroke and cancer, they haven't actually landed the planes until November, even when people had these medical emergencies. They had to treat them on station. Um, so one of the criteria for winter over, ideally, is to be able to survive for a year without needing medical attention. Um, and historically, it seems to work pretty well unless you're the doctor, because the doctor always seems to get sick. <laughs> Um, the open season, it ranges from about uh, minus 55 Celsius, which is, what, minus, it's about the same in Fahrenheit. Uh, it's cold. Uh, and then the warm temperatures tend to be sort of the minus uh, 25 Celsius. That's sort of the warm temperature. Well, the coldest temperature is around minus 80 Celsius. Uh, no, there's a treaty, Antarctic Treaty. So the, it forbids you to bring, for instance, animals or animals outside. 
Um, you're not allowed to bring nuclear power plants. Um, so, I mean, there are restrictions. But, it's, I mean, it's not a whole lot of restrictions for stuff like telescopes, right? You're only supposed to be doing scientific research. Um, and, in effect, your claim on the continent is based on where you're doing science, uh, which is why we have a continent at, at the station down there. Um, okay. So, as we talk about the telescope, let's review cosmology very briefly again. We are, of course, looking at primarily at the cosmic microwave background, which is that early hot universe. And if you viewed your universe in terms of people lifetime, something like the first day before you left the hospital after being born. Well, I mean, it started off 14 billion that years, but now, of course, it's at us since we're seeing it today. It's finally reached us from that point. Um, and it's pr pretty much... Yes, the last time, more or less the last time it, uh, you know, touched the matter, when it was last radiated, is 14 billion years ago. Oh, yeah, this is all artificial color, false color. This is, it is invisible, right? Um, so all of you are at it. It is, right, it's, uh, you know, like if you looked in a room, right, there'd be thermal radiation from the walls. Um, this is even colder temperatures than that, so it's you know even longer wavelength than if you were looking like an infrared scope. Uh, it's very long wavelength. Your eye is not sensitive to it. Um, after the cosmic background, um, you have the next few years when structures begin to form. Uh, off these initial uh, variations in density, those under the influence of gravity, you know the denser regions collect uh, matter by gra pulling it away from the underdense regions to form all the structures that we see around us. Uh, and by studying structure formation, you can learn about both things like dark matter, which is driving a lot of this structure formation. Uh, then you end up in the universe around us in the late time uh, structure, and that's sort of the end of the universe's lifetime, when dark energy has become important. And as we look at these cosmic microwave background maps I'm just going to show you, one nice part about doing an experiment like the South Pole Telescope it's all, although a lot of your information is coming from this very first instance of the universe's lifetime, the, the light has traveled through the entire universe. So it has some small imprint of the later time structure that has happened. Uh, so you do learn a little bit about the later universe as well, um, which you can't do without having the large mirror that we've been talking about. Well, um, Well, say like 90% of our photons will just travel without touching anything, um, but the remaining 10% have uh, interacted with some of this, this later time structure. So they're, different they're, different, they're different bits of light, but when they hit us, they, have, they, they hit us at the same time, yeah. But they're talking about actually different particles. Uh, roughly 13.7, 13.7 billion years ago, yes. I'm rounding up. <laughs> uh, so this is what the survey, the data that we have looks like. Uh, this is our map of the sky. It's about 2,500 square degrees, which is 6% of the sky. And if you want to see the actual its image on the uh, globe of the full night sky, this is where we are. Um, the area we are, but we're doing a smaller area of sky than satellite experiments. Uh, the main satellite experiments that you may have heard about would be WMAP or Planck. Uh, but we have both a much larger telescope, which allows us to see smaller features, and we have lower noise over the area that we, of sky that we are looking at. Uh, so we can see sm fainter and smaller objects. Now, if you want to look at faint, small objects, you don't actually see them when you look at these very large uh, scales that you see in this map, since this is 6% of the sky. So let's zoom in uh, from 2,500 square degrees down to 30 square degrees, so something like 5 by 6. And this is what that image looks like with the WMAP satellite image. Um, so you can see these are the few squiggles that you're seeing are the cosmic microwave background. Um, but you only see large scale variation. Now, since WMAP uh, finished their data, um, taking about a, 
a couple of years ago. Uh, the Plunk satellite has come on scene, which has a better resolution, uh, lower noise, but you're still only seeing the large scale wiggle on the experiment. Uh, you can see a lot of the features in common between the two experiments, as you would expect, since it's the same patch of sky. And this is what the South Pole Telescope looks like over the same region. So now you're still seeing those large scale wiggles, but you're starting to see some of these uh, features uh, that you might see on these very small scale things. And these features actually are coming from those structures along uh, the line of sight. Well, that's what's the next slide. <laughs> um, so the white dots, white in this uh, color scheme, means that you're getting more energy, more light from those points. Um, and these are either radio emission from, say, active galactic nuclei, i.e. matter falling into a black hole and then shooting out a jet of radiation from that black hole. Or this can be dust emission from star-forming galaxies. And the idea is that you have a starburst galaxy, it's producing lots of new stars, it's producing lots of uh, optical photons, and those optical light heats up the dust around those stars up uh, to, say, tens of Kelvin, and though that dust then re-radiates light uh, via thermal emission. And we see the thermal emission from the dust. And if you count up the total energy in the universe, about half of the optical background has been reprocessed by this into the submillimeter and millimeter wavelengths. Um, so it's a fairly substantial fraction of the universe's uh, energy density in these dusty galaxies, and a good way to look at high-redshift galaxies. This is real math. Uh, oh no, you mean this? This is just uh, yeah, this is the optical image of a similar galaxy. It is not from our data. Um, our I mean, the size of these dots is effectively set by our resolution. Um, the actual galaxies are much smaller than this dot, but we only have a fine, you know, we have a coarse resolution, so they look like larger objects in our maps. Um, so yeah, if you have an optical telescope, you can actually start to see some of the finer structures. Or if you go, you say ALMA, which is a new telescope in Chile, you can also see the substructure within these objects. Um, the second thing you might have noticed are dark spots. Again, roughly the size of our resolution on the map. Uh, now dark means that we're getting less energy, less light along that line of sight, as if there was something actually blocking those, that light between us and the surface of the last scattering. Um, and this is exactly what it is. It's a shadow on the cosmic micro background. Of course, the question then becomes, what can actually leave a shadow on astrophysical distance scale? And it turns out that these are galaxy clusters. Um, galaxy clusters can be a megaparsec across. Uh, these are the most largest collapsed objects in the universe. Um, they're dominated by, of course, dark matter. But in that dark matter potential, there's a lot of uh, diffuse plasma of, you know, hydrogen and the like. Uh, this this plasma is heated up as it falls into that massive potential well to 100 million Kelvin, uh, which is much hotter than the light coming from the cosmic micro background. So just like if you touch the stove and energy is transferred from the stove to your finger and burns you, if a photon from the cosmic micro background hits one of the electrons in this galaxy cluster, it's going to gain energy and get kicked up to higher frequencies where we will no longer see it. So the reason they, we see fewer photons here is that they've been kicked up to higher frequencies outside the frequency range that we are looking at. Um, so there are fewer, there's less light there along that line of sight for us. These are a great way to find galaxy clusters. Uh, you can use these to study, for instance, the expansion of the universe and dark energy, um, but I won't be talking about those in this talk. Um, and I'll be talking about, pretty much for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking just about the cosmic micro background, um, the light that hasn't been along that structure. Now, for studying the cosmic micro background, we are typically uh, looking at this power spectrum as a function of frequency. And this is analogous to if you hooked up an uh, instrument to an oscilloscope, and depending on what note you played, you would see a uh, line showing up at a different frequency range based on which note you were playing. And by looking at where uh, those sound waves showed up and the harmonics of it, you can learn something about your instrument, how sound was uh, bouncing around in your instrument, you know, the, what kind of string you were using, and other properties of your instrument. And similarly, by looking at the, the, the distribution of sound waves in our cosmic micro background map, you can learn about what stuff is making up the universe, um, how much dark matter there is, um, 
how many neutrinos there are, and other constituents of your universe. This turns out to be a calculation that's actually relatively easy to do um, and to compare it to predictions, which has made a strong link between the theory and our observations in our cosmological problem. And this has really motivated very strong experimental progress in looking at the cosmic microwave background. So I mentioned it took 27 years for the first anisotropy to be discovered um, after the cosmic microwave background was discovered. Um, and that was with Kobe. And Kobe measured the anisotropies down at L less than around 40 here. This is about, you know, seven degree scales on the sky. And 10 years after Kobe, we now had data out, you know, in two orders of magnitude smaller scales. Uh, we had suggestions of a peak here. We had higher order peaks, then a decrease in power, uh, less anisotropy, less structure as you go to smaller scales on the sky. And to give you a context here, if you had a wavelength of one degree on the sky, you'd be at this point on the sky, and then you'll go to smaller scales this way, so less than one degree, and then more than one degree in this direction. Um, five years after that, we had now the second uh, satellite experiment, WMAP, that I mentioned before, and showed you a map of. You had a balloon experiment, a boomerang on the second and third acoustic peak, the NACS bar my experiment going down through the damping tail. I marked with stars on these slides experiments that happened in Antarctica. Uh, the balloon experiments fly out of McMurdo. And ACBAR was, of course, at the South Pole Telescope. And then five years after that, uh, about a year ago, this is the measurements we had with the last release of the DEMAP satellite and then the first release of the full survey South Pole Telescope satellite. At this point, we actually had measured about nine peaks in this power spectrum. So there's a lot of features that you can look through in this power spectrum. Now, I'll just flip through this again, just to show you, remind you of how impressive this progress has been in making this measurement over the last few years. Now, in the last year, uh, of course, the third satellite result has come out, the Planck, this map you saw earlier. And it's now plotted on top of here. And there's excellent agreement between the different experiments, both on the ground and the satellites. And there is a model line plot on this plot, although you probably you may not actually see it because you can basically just follow the points um, to see the variations in this power spectrum. Now, I've called these uh, acoustic peaks. Uh, what do I mean by that? Effectively, we're talking about harmonics. So if you pluck a string, depending on how you pluck it, you would have, say, the first harmonic when you have a vibrational mode that has an uh, oscillation that looks like this, second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic. You know, depending on how many uh, modes you have per across the string, you'll call that higher order harmonics of your plucking, right? Now, for this, the cosmic microwave background, the string length that we have here is the size of the universe at that surface of the last scattering, the horizon size at the surface of the last scattering. And when we measure where our peaks are, we're effectively measuring how large the universe looks like uh, back a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So it tells us this idea of the distance scale in the early universe, um, which can be used combined. Uh, and we can calculate what this should be in physical units, since we know what this down horizon actually is. And we can calculate how long after the Big Bang this is, and then compare that to get something about, say, the geometry of the universe, whether it is flat or open or closed, for instance. You can also get information from the relative height of these uh, peaks to learn about the ratio, how much ordinary matter, like hydrogen, there is versus dark matter. Um, and then, of course, there is this damping structure, where we see a less structure as you go to smaller and smaller scales. And the reason you see less structure to small scales is effectively because there's a friction in the problem. Um, there's a damping term. And in this case, the damping term is that the photons, or the light, has a, a finite path length before it scatters. So if you get a very small structures between, in which photons do not have time to scatter multiple times, the photons will tend to escape of those kind of <coughs> over densities, and that will decrease your uh, signal on the very small scales. Um, so that's the power spectrum in a nutshell. And now we'll talk about the recent findings that we have on inflation. And for studying inflation, the way we're going to do this is primarily by looking at what are the initial conditions of the universe? So what did the universe start out as? Uh, since this is the, one of the main products of what inflation produces. And then from those initial conditions, we'll try to infer what caused inflation. 
There are a couple of different uh, initial variations that we know have to exist. The first will be variations in the density of the universe across the sky, right? We know there has to be variations in density because, of course, we, we exist. Uh, our planet exists, the star exists, etc. And these all form by gravitational collapse. Um, now, gravitational collapse doesn't need a very large variation in density to start off, right? It's equivalent to, you know, if you balance a pencil on a sand, you know, in principle, this would be a, you could last it, but if you have a small variation, it's going to fall over. And similarly, you need some small uh, variation in the density to seed your density perturbations, seed all the structure that we see today. So you'd like to study what is the spectrum of those initial seeds of your density fluctuation. One of the predictions of inflation is that uh, effectively you'll have a white noise. So it'll be a, at all scales, you'll have the same uh, spectrum. Uh, this is just like Johnson noise from a resistor or white noise on your television. And for historical reasons, we've generally parameterized this by uh, the power law of our frequency, uh, n sub s minus 1. So n sub s of 1 is scale invariance. And the prediction is basically scale invariance related to a time invariant in the inflation impact potential. Um, we, in fact, predict that it should not be identical because inflation does end, so it can't be perfectly time invariant. And if you have a small variation in that slope, it's going to lead to a small rotation of your power, your power of the cosmic micro background. You'll either have less power at large scales and more power at small scales or vice versa. Because um, we're seeing a process version of those initial perturbations. We now had you know, 300,000 years for those uh, perturbations to grow. Uh, with our current data, which is of course going to small scales, we now actually see uh, these variation away from scale invariance at high accuracy. Uh, with the Planck satellite, we now have something like a 7 sigma detection of a departure from scale invariance, which has uh, um, only happened in the last few years, have this significance. And you can then use that to learn about your, your models for inflation and compare that to your model spectrum. The second ingredient that you would have in an inflationary universe would be gravity waves. Now, you've probably have heard of gravity waves with, for instance, uh, merging black holes or neutron stars. Uh, when you have you know, two massive objects, Class to each other, they produce a spectrum of gravity radiation um, with the amplitude and frequency increasing as you approach the final merger point. And this is because those objects are stretching and distorting space time in a time varying way. Now, if you consider what happens during inflation when you have this superluminal expansion of space time, you get gravity waves from that distortion as well. Uh, and the amplitude, the power in your gravity waves, is going to depend on how quickly you are pulling space-time apart. Um, so if you pull space-time faster, you expect more gravity waves from the inflationary epoch. So you can learn something about how quickly the universe was expanding um, during inflation by looking at the gravity wave spectrum. The problem is, um, this is, of course, uh, hard to do with an experiment like LIGO. It's because of the scale of your problem. This is a plot just showing you know, different wavelengths of gravity waves and experiments going after them. And LIGO is over here. It's something like a kilometer uh, laser interferometry. And then going for gravity waves is periods on the order of 10 milliseconds. Um, while the gravity waves from inflation have periods on the order of a billion years. So it's on much longer time scales, much longer wavelengths. And you can't observe it from a solar system sized uh, experiment. So you have to go to another experiment like the cosmic micro background to see these gravity waves. The other issue with these gravity waves is that they do decay inside an expanding universe. Um, and this is why LIGO hopes there's you know, nearby emerging black holes and neutron stars. And on the cosmic background, this means that we get our largest signal on very large scales. So if we change the amount of gravity waves in the universe, this is the impact it has on the power spectrum that I showed you earlier. Effectively, there's no impact on these smaller scales. And on the several degree scales, you'll see some change in the slope. Um, and that's because these gravity waves start to decay after they uh, enter the horizon and begin to evolve uh, with time. And these are the scales that were outside the horizon uh, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Um, given that this is all happening on many degree scales on the sky, you might ask, why do you care about a ground-based experiment like the South Pole Telescope? 
uh, where our data is really starting only you know, on this scale and smaller. And the answer is that there are uncertainties that can correlate between these gravity waves on large scales and other parameters in your model, like the slope of the scalar perturbations that I showed you on the uh, previous slide, which would just look like a shift in the slope on the very large scales. So by, um, if you look at, say, the best fit models for the satellite experiments on large scales, uh, for two different values of the gravity wave background, uh, zero gravity waves and about a third of the power in gravity waves that you have in the density variation, um, they agree perfectly well on the large scales, and then they start to vary on the small scales uh, because of this degeneracy with that slope and other parameters like dark matter. So a small scale experiment can break that degeneracy and give you a better measurement of what the gravity wave background is. And that is what we did with the Southwell Telescope, leading to the best measurement that we have on the gravity wave background. Um, in fact, this is about as well as you can do from uh, the temperature fluctuations, given the uncertainties uh, related to the density fluctuations. You can't distinguish between the gravity waves and the density fluctuations um, below this point. And we have a 95% confidence limit that the gravity waves are less than 11% of the density fluctuations on large scales. Uh, this is interesting because you can now actually start to put constraints on your models for inflation. Um, there's, of course, a large set of models for inflation. And in general, the current data is somewhat favoring models which have smaller, very uh, slower expansion during the time potential. And you can loosely group your models into models that are called large field models or small field models, depending on whether the inflaton potential is changing by more or less than a Planck mass. Um, and large models tend to predict a large background of gravity waves, a, a faster expansion, which we don't see, so we're generally favoring small field models, although we don't completely exclude the large field models. And the idea here is that if you write down a form for your inflaton potential, like phi to the fourth, um, given some fun factors like what the prefactor is in front of the phi to the fourth, you would predict a given range of n sub s and the gravity wave background, and you would follow along here. And as you can see, that range of n sub s and r, the gravity wave background is ruled out at more than two sigma from the current data. So we just favor that kind of model. Um, so our data is starting to rule out some sets of models, uh, although clearly we'd like more data uh, in order to really pin down on different model sets. In order to do that, uh, the way forward is with polarization of the cosmic micro background. Um, this is polarized light, just like if you had, uh, say, reflections off snow or the road to be polarized reflections. Um, and polarized light uh, in the, this context is basically viewed as a vector field on the sky. So you can have you know, a set of directional lines. Um, and you can break this down into modes that are analogous to electric, electricity, E modes, and modes that have analogous to magnetic fields are B modes. And the nice part about this decomposition is that due to symmetry arguments, those density fluctuations that uh, confuse you when looking at the temperature variations they don't produce any B modes, uh, B mode polarization. So there's only two sources of B modes. One would be gravity waves, and this happens on the very large scales. And one would be actually on smaller scales, you can also get this gravitational lensing to measure the dark matter in the universe. And there's two experiments at UC Berkeley going for this um, Polar Bear, which is in Chile, in the Atacama Plateau. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Polar Bear focal plane. And then the South Pole Telescope at the South Pole. And some of the science that they hope to get out of this would be better limits on the gravity wave background uh, sourced by inflation, basically a factor of two to three improvement on our gravity wave background, and also better mapping out the matter distribution of the universe uh, to learn about structural formation via gravitational lensing. And one thing you can do with that is you can learn about, say, you can weigh how massive neutrino species are, and our best limits right now on the mass of the neutrino is coming from these cosmological observations. And uh, polar bear ST pole can get about 100 milli electron volts for the mass of our neutrino species. And the exciting recent news is that we've actually had the first uh, detection of these B modes in the last year or so. Uh, both pol SBT pole and polar bear have now detected uh, the B mode signature in lensing. Uh, we did this in a cross correlation technique, doing a cross correlation between the CMB data and data from. Uh, Herschel Spire, which is a submillimeter satellite. Uh, so it's fairly insensitive to any kind of experimental 
error that might duplicate this signal. Um, and we detect it at fairly high significance, about 7.7 .7 sigma for SVT pull and 4 sigma significance for uh, polar bear. So, and that's a good step forward to actually pursuing these gravity waves and lensing science that we hope to do in the future. And I'll just conclude there um, and ask if there are any questions.
there's some horizontal striping across this map, and that's because we only our telescope is only scanning this direction. So all of our scans are in one direction, so we get more noise in this direction. I mean, our noise is not it's not symmetric on the sky. Um, effectively, if you have you know low frequency noise, it's one over f. It all shows up as stripes. Sean Carroll, um, uh, and some of his stuff is actually, I think, like an over presentation or, or some other kind of TV show. And, he, and his, his books as well, he really thinks about, you know, why, why, why does cause and effect run in the direction that it does? Sean Carroll. Carroll. Yeah, C A W R O. Uh, 
astronomy telescope, and that is a 25 meter telescope, um, so two and a half times larger, um, and it's going to be at 17 or 18 thousand feet in the Chilean uh, Atacama Plateau, um, and so they will have better resolution. Um, in principle, you can combine the images from different telescopes, and people have certainly done that in the past, but, you know, combined maps and satellites and ground base. Um, obviously, CCAT hasn't been built yet, so it can't be done yet. Um, and, yeah. and most of the interferometry experiments, um, like ALMA, are doing much smaller areas of sky, so there's not a whole lot of to be gained by combining them, just because of how much sky they're actually there. Energy, for instance, the galaxy clusters of uh, sample telescopes can be used to look at the properties of dark energy. Um, and so far, all of our measurements of dark energy are consistent with the cosmological constant that Einstein proposed. Um, no one's detected evidence for something besides the cosmological constant. Uh, although the data is not that uh, stringent when you start thinking about how dark energy may have varied over time. So they're still certainly open to having, I mean, people don't really know what dark energy is, and it's still a large mystery. Um, there's certainly an active area of research. Let's take just one more question. Uh, practical applications? Um, so the detectors have practical applications, I should say. I mean, the, obviously the science itself is less practical, uh, but our detectors, you know, the same detectors show up in near airports, microwave detectors. <laughs> Uh, for airport scanners, they've been used for <coughs> nuclear, nuclear radiation detectors. Um, so the detector technology has some practical applications. Um, and actually, speaking of information, um, I mean, we do use multiplexing and cell phone multiplexing techniques for some of the multiplexing that goes on uh, to read out more detectors on the same uh, bandwidth. Thank you very much.